Uh, I'll start like this. You know, we don't have in our tradition this big Shabbat Haggadol drush where we have to go through every bit of the laws of the Passover Seder in order to figure out what's new. You know, at times when there were new products coming out year to year, that was very important. At times when the codes of Jewish law were expanding and people were interested in making sure that they were completely chametz free and that Pesach would be set, the Shabbos Haggadol drush really was important. Other communities, it was a more philosophical time and a thought orientation time, Shabbat Haggadol, the Shabbat before Pesach, to really think things through. Instead of doing it next Shabbat or before next Shabbat, I thought we would do that Sunday. And this is like a Shabbat Haggadol gathering in that sense. And I hope that this will inspire some thinking through on the spiritual side and on the Seder side and on the holiday side, some, some really good thoughts about how we are uh, really going to create a, a redemptive, joyous, meaningful, powerful Pesach this year. Uh, and given our current reality, even given our recurrent, current reality with all of what we might not love about it, how we're going to stitch it together in a way that really makes for a, a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. So that's the framing in, in its entirety. To the specific, I thought of the question Manishtana as a way to say, how should we make this different this year in very specific ways? And I thought of the Manishtana section as something that is very familiar to us and that brings us joy and that may bring us back to memories as kids or of our kids. Uh, and of course, like we have to get the energy going to actually recite that passage with gusto if we're the one doing it, whether we're 28, 58, 88, Mela, or beyond. And so we have to really embrace Manishtana. And so uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just like one suggestion about how we make things different in our homes and at our Seder this year. And then I'm going to roll over into some specific Manishtana history. And we're going to explore the history of Manishtana as a matter of you know, kind of the inquiry we, we like to make in our community, intellectual inquiry. I'm gonna suggest that there's a paradigm of, of building inquiry as a very important part of the Pesach preparation and Seder experience. And thusly, it might open us to making our Seder a little different together by way of looking at some Torah, about Pesach and what we do a week out before the Pesach Seder. Uh, this might inform what we do that very night at the Seder or help us bring new material to our Pesach Seder. And then finally, we'll just end with a little bit of reflection on the importance of questions uh, that are contained within this paradigm the rabbis created for us of holiday celebration of Passover itself. And then uh, we'll have a little dialogue. So to start though, I want to tell you that in Masechet Pesachim and in Masechet Shabbat, in the two tractates of Gemara, Rabba and Abaye both say it's good to start with a little laughter. They would make a joke and then start their lectures. And this happens at, in Masechet Pesachim, I think, for a reason, and at, on Shabbos for a reason. Those were the times that people got together and they really were experiencing the, the, an intellectual kind of meal as much as they were making good food to eat. And so they would open with a little bit of a bidi chuta, with a little bit of laughter. And so let me offer you this. Uh, as I suggested, one way to make a difference this year within your homes for the Seder experience. I just said at the end of Minyan, and I'll expand on it here. You know, when we think about our tables and what we set them with, I want to remember the guys who left Egypt who were walking through the Sea of Reeds who were joking the whole way out. Did you see what Moses is wearing? You know, did, you, did, you, did you see the, the look on their face, the, the, the jokes about Egypt, the, the, the realities of what was going on made a little easier to swallow by a little humor? And so the one way that I'm going to say that we should make our seders different this year, especially during this crazy pandemic, is that we should look for ways to create laughter. 
look for ways to create a little bit of a humorous experience even, and whether or not that's kind of just funny pace off jokes that you find or some kind of uh, cartoons that I'm about to show you and you think about it in a, in a humorous way, print them out, put them around the table, put some pace off cartoons that you like and you think are funny, uh, ask people to come up with, uh, bring a joke to the Seder. Appropriate, of course, appropriate, of course, because laughter is a sign of redemption. You remember that the psalm we say before Birkat Hamazon says, Shir amalot b'shuv Adonai et shivatzion ha'inu kecholmim az yemales chok pinu. As then God will fill Yimale Schok Pinu. God will fill our mouths with laughter. Part of redemption and getting out of the exile or getting out of slavery for our people has been laughter. Now that's a joy deep within the heart, which is not an out loud laughter for silly slapstick or jokes or things like this, but there's a sense that warming ourselves up to really receive the redemptive message is also with a little bit of more smiling, more laughter, and, and more, more humor. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to spotlight my video, and if you want to see me uh, just next to the material I'm going to share, you can choose speaker view instead of gallery view at the corner. That will just make a difference. If you keep it on gallery view, you get a strip of people across the top, which is fine too, however, which way you want to do it. All right, first sharing. Hold on one second. Got to set it up behind. Hold on, I'm getting there to the setup. Forgive me. Okay, so. Should be in presentation mode now. You should be seeing on your screen in a minute a text. All right, Zoom Management 101 here. Okay, uh, if you can see the Talmud Brachot 31A, give me a thumbs up. Okay. Looks like people can see it, yes? Sorry, just getting clear here. I'm using two screens and I'm just making sure. Okay, so that's good. You see the Talmud? Okay, so Rabbi Yochanan says about that, filling our mouths with laughter. Mishum Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, in the name of Rabbi ben Yochai, Asr la'adam shi'yamale shokpi ba'olam azeh. It's not necessarily proper to fill our mouths with total laughter, to feel only joy in this world. Shinemar, as it says in Tehillim, as it says in the book of Psalms, as Yamalev Schopinu will shonenu rina. God will ultimately fill our mouths with laughter and our tongues will be singing. And when is that exact time? At that time when they shall say among the nations, the Lord has done great things with these people or for these people. They said of Reish Lakish that uh, that he never filled again his mouth with laughter in this world after he heard this saying from Rabbi Yochanan, his teacher. So I, I just present you a sense of what some in the Talmud 
really say is a very kind of serious mindset that one has to have in this world because we're waiting for the total greatness of redemption and, and the world to come. And Reish Lakish took that on and uh, he, he was serious about taking that on. And remember that in his life, he had a lot of joy and he had a lot of uh, a kind of enjoyment of this world before he became a re rehabilitated, really a rehabilitated uh, a robber. And, 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 and that there are certain sages in our tradition who come back to the, the, the tradition because they want the serious moral path, the way ahead of them, and they need it to uh, kind of control their Yetzir Haru. So if you were looking at this Gemara and you said, no, 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 we don't want to do anything specifically to fill our mouths with joy and to create uh, the sense that some religious ritual could be humorous and could contain laughter, you're in good company because Reish Lakish was really a sharp and smart chacham. He was a good sage. And if you think that my bringing cartoons to suggest for the Seder table is really outside the bounds, you would have company in the sense that if we were really kind of looking at this intellectually as we are, that it's really not okay. It's really, you know, come on, don't really put this on us that we have to generate any more laughter than is natural and necessary in the context of family. That, that religious ritual is not about this world. It, it, he's waiting for the skulk of the Olam Abba. He's waiting for the laughter of the world to come in the redemption. But I'm not going to wait so long. So that, the point is, I'm not waiting so long. And I'm suggesting that we try to generate. And, and yes, some of these are kind of the lower brow of that in order to make some laughter and have some fun at our Seder table. But the idea is, is that we're generating a more joyous and, and, and even humorous experience within our religious context. Look at this. This definitely, this cartoon represents me until I came to learn how not to shop before Passover. So there's a little bit of redemption in the sense that I brought no extra amounts of hummets and yeast and bread and, and crackers uh, that I found on sale at any big box stores. The pandemic has done wonders but for me in keeping me from bringing into the house anything that I don't need at Pesach time. But look at the next. This is, I, sh I showed this at the end of Minion. Rabbi, we can't see your uh, cartoons. Oh, you can't see? No. Hold on. How about now? Diane, how about now? Diane, I, I'm not seeing Rabbi, it. It. Yes, yes, we can see it. Yes, yes. Rabbi, you can see it now. Great. We see it. Okay. So this is the one that I was saying, uh, the pandemic has at least done it's a little bit of good for our house. Because this happens. I'm out there, I see, I see something that I think we need to store away. No. Okay, so then this one I showed at the end of Minion. Just fun in our age of too many protests, in my estimation. Free Pesach protests by the Hamids. Technology and Pesach. You know, even before this crazy pandemic and all the use of Zoom and what have you, there are cartoons that circulated in our age of technology. And uh, this one always caught my eye year to year. If there were cell phones at the Red Sea, we'd stop for those selfies. It's all about us, right? But the, the cartoonist picks up on something that we have to take very seriously. And that is an idea that Pesach is not only about us, really is not about us. Moses is mentioned, well, some people want to say Moses is not mentioned in the Haggadah. That's actually incorrect. Moses is mentioned in the Haggadah. So let me just dispel that. Moses is mentioned as Moshe Avdo, as Moses is God's servant. And that's in a midrash about the 10 plagues. And of course, what, what the cartoonist is focused on is not making it about us and the selfie, but about making God 
a center of our focus. So the idea that we create a relationship with God in this mix of the Pesach experience is really an important one. And we think about God's place in history. Anybody who's really intellectual about that question and would like to read further on God's you know, kind of presence in history, I highly commend to you the book by Emil Fackenheim, the great philosopher, God's Presence in History. And he's the post-Holocaust philosopher, made Aliyah, Israeli. And I see the sun is doing funky things with my face. So he's the philosopher whose book you could read if you really want to get into that philosophical question. Next cartoon, picking up still on this use of technology, and of course we're going to all decide whether or not we want to Zoom or not, and how we're going to integrate technology into our lives for the Yuntas. Of course, last year I already wrote a whole piece, you can find it on the website, about setting aside the laws of Yuntiv to use Zoom on Pesach because of the spirit of community and family that individual people can decide at their homes what they want to do with it. That still holds for pandemic 2021. And so you should just find that article. It's a three or four page halachic and uh, you know, kind of spiritual guide to why and how we use Zoom. It's on the website. And if you really can't find it, write to me and I can send it to you if you want to read the article. But here, we were already in the age of computers thinking about technology and its uses and you know the encounter that our ancestors might have with it and Moses is sitting here at the computer and said, God sent you a message <laughs> and Pharaoh is no longer your friend right so you know we're not the first to be thinking about these things over the course of uh, recent Pesach history and there is last year somebody created <laughs> Pesach 2020 Here's the way to go. It's all one computer speaking to the next. And, uh, you know, I hope that we can sense each other's human presence beyond just our flat panel veil of glass kind of reality with one another when we get on these learning journeys and these lectures. And uh, I've, I've felt everyone's communal presence at the last couple of scholars talks we've had. And of course, with davening online, I think it's somewhat questionable whether or not we really know each other's presence on these Zoom panels, but it, it is working for, for what it needs to work for at this stage and, and, and in our time. And so, you know, one computer talking to the next, somebody's got to be out there. Who wants to lead Dayenu is the cartoonist's uh, question. And then, of course, this one, it's a little blurry, I'm sorry, but, you know, here's the Zoom Seder and then Elijah comes in <laughs> on the phone, a mix of phones and computers led me in my article that I mentioned to really say there is not a kosher, in my opinion, there is not a kosher way. It's not halachic, the use of all these computers and te technologies. But sometimes setting aside that since we have that the total frameworks of forbidden to use electronics on a personal level in our homes is, is what's needed, uh, then that's, that's kind of where I'm seeing the permissibility for these pieces of technology to really be invoked and engaged during Passover. Uh, given our friend Dr. Cooperman's talk and how many of our Christian neighbors are celebrating Passover because of certain scholars' takes that the Last Supper was connected to the Passover holiday, I just couldn't resist putting this one in the mix as well. And I sent it off to Dr. Cooperman so that if she's looking for images for her new book about the Christian engagement with uh, the Seder, then uh, she might consider uh, taking a little bit of, of what's going on. I wonder how many of those neighbors are really Zooming their Seders with such a, a Pew study result of how many Christians are engaging a Passover Seder experience, whether it's exactly a Passover Seder, whether or not it's uh, supersessionism on the rise in a new way, soft supersessionism. Dr. Jessica Cooperman's talk last Thursday uh, already really set out some great questions about Passover in our era. And you could think about really holding your Pesach Seder 
as a way of truly sustaining authentic Jewish tradition in light of all Dr. Cooperman taught us on Thursday night. And if you haven't listened to her lecture yet, I, I highly recommend that you do when the recordings come out. I'll be putting them out this week, hers and her partners, Dr. Lactor's, about Kabbalah and history. So just a little tease for her lecture in here, but what, what a fun image. Uh, of course, getting ready means going out to all the different stores at all the right times. And uh, maybe you want to have your Pesach attire, your matzah attire. I've got my tie today. Uh, I, I commend to you that some of them are out there. Um, if you're a, a collector of these things for any which way or reason, uh, I just think it's some fun and not necessarily studio, uh, not necessarily only nonsense. I think that there's just something about uh, the production of some of these things this year that says a lot about Jewish resilience. And finally, I'll just share, uh, what is a taste of the world to come by way of the Gemara? The Gemara really holds that a taste of the world to come is creating some laughter and cheering people up. In the marketplace, in the everyday space of our lives, and I, I would hold at the Seder table. And however we're gonna do that in our families, let it be a difference this year that we, we create some of this and generate it. In Tani, which we learned last year in the Beit Midrash, um, those of us in Talmud class, we see Amar Lei Hanach Nami Bnei Alma Da'atei uh, Two men were, past, were, were conversing and they passed by Eliyahu Anavi, who's of course a star at our Seder, and Elijah is a presence at our Seder, and, they, and Elijah comes in Talmudic literature and is someone that you can talk to and you can ask questions of, and it doesn't have to be only at the Pesach Seder, but it might just be on a day when you really need to feel some redemption. That's the context here. There was no water and there was a drought and they were in the marketplace and Elijah comes. That's the context. And uh, he says, these two have a share in the world to come. And Elijah says, these two, look at them. They have a share in the world to come. And so Rabbi Broca goes and he asks them, What's, what do you do? What do you do in life that Eliyahu Anavi, that Elijah the prophet says that you have a share in the world to come? My avaydaychu, what do you do in the world that makes Elijah know that you're going to get your portion in the world to come? You're going to taste a little redemption even on a daily level in this world. That's what I would say the question really is. And Amrule, these two guys who are in the marketplace, who Elijah knows are those who can taste a little redemption in life. He says, atsivi. We are those who are jesters. He says, Anishe anan. We are jesters. We are those who create a little laughter. We cheer people up. atsive. We are those who bring long faces into laughter. We are those who bring long faces into laughter. This is also an area of the Gemara that's very interesting because it recognizes what we might call in our time clinical depression. And that at a certain level, that there's a way to engage people who uh, are depressed and that it's not just in terms of just surface laughter, but that we take we take the time within the marketplace to go and engage these folks in a cheerful way. In other words, we are welcoming of people who are even feeling a little bit down in the doldrums or who are expressing that they might be a little depressed and we go and we engage them. And any kind of sense that we have that life right now is not full out the way we want it to be, and that we uh, have to engage each other in, in a way that you know, brings out the redemptive spirit, that's kind of what we are talking about in, in as much as we are talking about just creating some potential laughter at, around our tables. All right, let me stop to share for a minute. So that is the, the opening, how to make it a little different. Figure out what it means to create a Seder experience and a Seder table 
that has some space for laughing in a different way, for finding a little joy, for rising up in song together. I'm sure you can find online some uh, what might be, uh, you know, let's say you were looking for a corny opening joke for a speech you were making during the Passover season. You might find some of those. You might have some humorists in your family who could write a dialogue between God and Moses and uh, amplify the God-Moses conversation. You might ask people to uh, represent different kind of characters going through the Sea of Reeds when we sing Dayenu and make mention of the fact that we have uh, traveled on to redemption. So really, really, kind of a fun, different angle of, of making the Seder experience come alive. Uh, all right, let me stop for a second, because that'll be like the, the, uh, the humor angle. And then we're going to move into the history of Manishtana and a little bit of intellectual inquiry in, into those questions before we get to a creative approach to what that might mean for us, picking out the attitudes uh, of the rabbis and the paradigm that they create for generating questions. But so, so far, I'm going back to gallery view for a minute so I can see everybody. Anybody have a comment or a question about just this section that we've hit so far? Yes, Rabbi. Yes. So with your indulgence, uh, we, are, we, we preceded this uh, presentation of yours about <laughs> humor a number of years ago by adding some humor to uh, Passover Seders. Just to take a little break. Well, not a break, but um, a pause where groans are allowed. <laughs> and, um, and so I, if you don't mind, I could take a minute or two to share some, and I'm willing to email it out to you. So uh, a, a series of songs and a series of jokes. So um, a group of leading medical researchers have published data indicating that SATA participants should not partake of both chopped liver and cirrhosis. It seems that this combination can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> but I'm done. But it's always a bit on Too many years in the Catskills. Uh, at our Seder, we had whole wheat and bran matzah fortified with Metamucil. The brand name, of course, is Let My People Go. <laughs> All Jewish men in Miami get hernias from wearing chais, which are too heavy. This condition is called Chiaidal hernia. Uh, if a doctor carries a black bag and a plumber carries a toolbox, what does a mayo carry? A brisket. Okay, a song. Um, there's no business. I'm sorry, there's no Seder like our Seder. There's no Seder I know. Everything about it is halachic. Nothing that the Torah won't allow. Listen how we read the whole of Gada. It's all in Hebrew, of course we know how. There's no Seder like our Seder. We tell a tale that is swell. Moses took the people out into the heat. They baked the monster while on their feet. Now isn't that a story that just can't be beat? Let's go on with the show. Okay, good. So that's exactly the, uh, you know, kind of the shtiklach that could happen out there. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you, for <laughs> thank you for sharing uh, openly. And, and I'll take any file. Please send it over. Uh, in our family, we ask people, anybody listen to the uh, uh, game show on NPR about the media, the funny game show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And they have three people tell fake news stories. And the guest who's on the line has to guess which one is actually true versus the, the two that are false. So what we do is we ask people to come up with funny, false Pesach stories, like the first one that Aaron uh, presented. And the three of them uh, are, are you know, dip false stories, if you will. And then I usually have a true Pesach story to share, as opposed to those three funny, false ones that people come up with. And we, we've asked people to, of course, bring Divrei Torah for other parts of the Haggadah as well, which is a way to make your Seder different this year if you, that's not something that you normally do. We ask people to pick one part of the Seder and say, okay, you present about Dayenu. 
you present a little reflection on the 10 plagues. How about taking the Hallel? And so people are invited in our Siddharim to come and bring Divrei Torah that are serious and traditional and explicate those parts of the Haggadah that we think are important or that we don't know enough about and we want to know more. But we also ask people sometimes to bring these Seder jokes or write a funny fake Seder Pesach news story and put, put, make it like a wait, wait, don't tell me. And we do that at Shulchan Arech in our, in our house. We do that during the meal so that there's an engagement during the meal of, of that kind of thing. All right, other, uh, another question, clarification, a share? All right, let me, let me move us forward. So again, uh, my video is spotlighted. If you want to just kind of have me in the center, you can go to speaker view and, or the gallery view, depending on which one you want. But uh, let, me, let, let me start the intellectual inquiry about questions in this way. Uh, there's a Nobel laureate in physics who died uh, on January 11th, 1988, and his name was Isidore Rabi. And they, they asked him, why did you become a scientist rather than a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman like the other immigrant kids in your neighborhood? And his answer has served as an inspiration. And the answer he gave was, my mother made me a scientist without intending it. Every other Jewish mother in Brooklyn would ask her child after school, so did you learn anything today? But not my mother. She always asked me a different question. Izzy, she would say, did you ask a good question today? And that difference, asking good questions, made me become a scientist. Now, different Jews uh, around the Jewish world have a different or story, a different core story for that Jewish tale, right? We don't ask, did you have a good day at school? We ask, did you ask a good question? The story has been told in the name of the Baal Shem Tov. The story has been told in the name of Rabbi Nachman. The story has been told in the name of the Kutzker Rebbe. The story has been told by many a Jewish educator in the name of people who have emotional connectivity to those in our lives so that we become really attuned to the idea of asking questions. This is what Primo Levi said, who was a Holocaust survivor and then a prolific writer. He said about what's out there, monsters exist, but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. Listen to what he said, even the Holocaust survivor, Primo Levi. Monsters exist, but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the common men, the functionaries ready to believe and to ask without asking questions. And so when we create a culture around our Seder tables, which is primarily the way that every Jewish individual first encounters godliness within the context of the Jewish people's tradition. Because remember, it's in their homes, in lockdown, sitting vigil for redemption on the night of the exodus of Egypt with a sacrifice to make meaning of their encounters with the material world around them. The lamb was a physical holy object in Egypt. And the monster that Pharaoh and Egypt represents is in their focus. They are encouraged that night to say, does our situation have to remain the same? And Primo Levi, the Holocaust survivor says, that our culture of questioning is a culture that brings the common folk into dialogue with that which we think is standard and needs to stay the same. 
Now that for us is very important in our time and especially during this pandemic as vaccination starts and more and more scientific data becomes available to us. We're gonna to have to ask, are we willing to stay in this mode? But that's a topic that the Health and Safety Committee is gonna to have to tackle and I think very soon. For us as Jews, our notion here is that our asking questions is at the core of our culture. And that's because we can't simply accept that which is the reality around us. We have to question it. And sometimes we'll get answers that it's worth staying the same. And sometimes we'll get answers that it's worth doing something a little differently. Where the rabbis paradigmatically have introduced us to that entire conception of Jewish life is with the Manish Tana section of the Haggadah. And the questions that they're going to start to have us ask are a rehearsal of questions that say, what does this ritual that we're about to engage in really mean? What do the rituals that we might take for granted really mean? And then that in terms of making an analog to life, why are we accepting this as the policy, the law, the way that halakha demands of us? Why, in terms of our civil life and our religious life, do we do any of these? And that leads to a literature that we're not going to get into today called Ta'ameha HaMitzvot, but that is the tastes or the reasons behind the mitzvot. Manish Tana has, over the millennia, changed. The questions themselves have changed. They have morphed a little bit. There's some that is anchored in the ancient set of questions that is presented in our Mishnah and in the earliest manuscripts of the Haggadah. And there's a little bit of a change that we have to track and then ask, Okay, so what does that mean to us? Because what we're doing today is we're asking, what does it really mean to us that we can see the history of the Pesach Seder, the changes that have been made over time to this list of questions, and what we ought to do to make our Seders different this year. There is an irony in the spirit of the rabbi's writings about Pesach. The Seder is an orchestrated pageant, a set ritual, and requires performing rituals in a specific way or order. And yet, the evening of Passover is to be a night full of questions and explorations of the Passover story, so that children, the children of Israel, will maintain their interest in the story of redemption and consider God's place in our lives and in history and our connection to the narrative of the Jewish people throughout time. The rabbis were masters of designing rituals and liturgy that have already been sustained over thousands of years. And at the same time, that tradition calls for engaging in what we call keva, which is the set standard liturgy, like what's printed now in our Haggadah, we have to, of course, go with what the Mishnah says. You have to create kavana. You have to create meaningful ritual. You have to ask new questions. And so there's no place for robotic rituals. The same way the prophets say, don't bring me your empty sacrifices and don't bring me your empty fasts, we have to create some space for new meaning and new questions. So the sages saw the Seder as a home-based service for which you could use the Haggadah, but that you needed to create a space for a renewal of engagement. And so with our Jewish homes, we think about individual Jews taking on that responsibility to change something up or to figure out what needs to be done in amidst the use 
of the standard liturgy of our most printed book, the Haggadah. Every indication is that the rabbis realize what modern educational philosophers like Schwab thought about the individual people who would come to celebrate Pesach. Schwab says that one must take into account the milieu, the teachers and leaders, the curriculum, and the students. And we must figure out as leaders and teachers, as those who have sedarim, participants, as students of the tradition, in our milieu, what are the necessary tools and what are potentially the new questions we ought to ask, but being truthful and loyal to both the spirit of the holiday and the actual liturgy of the Haggadah. The book of Proverbs already taught what Schwab highlighted in his modern educational philosophy, Hanoch Na'ar al Pidarko, you shall teach a child according to his or her own way. Codes of Jewish law know that any encounter with a holiday requires preparation. And for the Pesach holiday, we are quite familiar with getting rid of our chametz, cleaning the houses, and setting aside everyday dishes. They also are insistent that we start learning the Haggadah and reviewing its content on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. You cannot simply take a Haggadah out of the box the night of the Seder and fulfill all the Jewish laws. In that vein, the study of our Haggadah today is a fulfillment of a rabbinic injunction to actually prepare with the learning that we must do given the Haggadah as a central text. We don't have a time like with the Torah that we take it out and read it on a weekly basis, but from Rosh Chodesh Nisan, one may decide to review one section of the Haggadah at a time, or sit in study with a chevruta, and there have been over the Jewish centuries special chevruta during the Passover season among Jews to learn and relearn the Haggadah and its component parts. That's a topic to discuss at another time as to what those special learning books for Pesach really look like. But as a reminder to us, we are learning today in terms of making a difference in our seders and the Manish Tana section to fulfill a Jewish law written into the Shulchan Aruch that says one must engage in the learning of the Haggadah from Rosh Chodesh Nisan forward. Here we are a week away and we're thinking about how to make our seders different. We already mentioned that we could make them a night for laughter and humor. This year, we may wish to focus more deeply on really doing a bidikat chametz. We've been in our homes during the course of the pandemic, and they have become typical places for work and for eating all kinds of chametz and bread. We've done less eating out. Let's make this a year where bidikat chametz, where the cleanup for chametz is meaningful, powerful, and purposeful. And we, of course, start to gather all the groceries we need, thinking about the Seder symbols we need for the Seder plate and pillows and the like, thinking about which Haggadahs we're going to use, and maybe figuring out which new wine we'll drink, because the rabbis, for motivating us to learn, also saw wine as a very important element of the Seder experience licensed to get a great new Israeli red or white, depending on your choice. Of course, there is this night of questions to consider, the Manishtana. What ideas within Manishtana help us create a difference this year? What is the history of Manishtana? And how shall we look back at that history as a license to create some new questions for our seders this year. In arts education, there's an approach for developing more knowledgeable audience members, participant art, arts audiences, and potentially amateur artists 
who sit in the seats in order to experience the art of a great artist or creator. I bring in arts education methodology because part of what we will, will do today in terms of this investigation of Manish Tana is to embrace this look at the history of Manish Tana as a license or a gateway to look at certain verses of our Torah potentially in the same mode and framework of creativity that our sages engaged in, in order to create the original liturgy or liturgies of our Haggadah today. We will both be students of history, but we will also be creators of the art of the Seder. And borrowing from this process that the Lincoln Center Institute uses with students and teachers around the world allows us to feel like we are both activating the paradigms that the rabbis created in the creation of the art form of the Manish Tana, which we will study as a matter of intellectual history. So we need to look at the sources for Manish Tana and the differences in the lists of questions that have been used throughout time. I'm going to now share my screen and hopefully be able to see some of you or ask uh, again, Diane, maybe you'll unmute and tell me that you actually see my source, my source sheet. That's for the yes. No, not now. I saw it disappear. No, no it, was, it looked like it was showing up and now it's not. All right, hold on. Okay. She uh, went on the website and there was an opening for that afternoon. So, oh, just okay. Sorry, I was and, uh, talking to his niece. Yeah. So, and uh, we could go. Uh, you see it now? It now we do. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the first. No, not this one. Hold on one second. I just am having a little bit of screen share dilemma here. Okay, I think I got it. Let me try it again. All right, you should see the Haggadah Shel Pesach and the Magi, the four questions. Good? Okay, so the, the standard Manishtana we all might be familiar with. Manishtana Laila Zemiko Hallelujah. There are wonderful articles about the tunes of Manishtana. You might want to tune into one of those. You should get the gusto to recite it, even if you don't have any kids around anymore. You should recite it with a, a passion for questions that comes along with Jewish culture. And so this is just a reminder to read it over and get those words down and write. The, the four questions classically that we are all familiar with, I've highlighted down below. Matzah, maror, dipping, and reclining. You'll be shocked to know that no classic manuscript of the Haggadah from early on in the Talmudic period or the Gaonic period or even early medieval period has our list of questions. The question about reclining is a much later addition to the Haggadah and most likely came to replace a question about roasted meat, which you might have heard before. But the reason why it replaced the question about roasted meat, if that is the entirety of the story, is because the Shulchan Aruch created a code of law. And before that, other codes of law included the notion that we did not eat a 
full roasted lamb on Passover evening. Now, it did not actually forbid eating roasted meat. In fact, many do eat roasted meat, and there are certain communities where that's a delicacy to eat roasted lamb. But eating a full lamb, putting it on a spit and roasting it over a fire was indeed forbidden, but some Jews just can't help themselves and they need to say it's totally forbidden when there's a very specific law given about what exactly is forbidden. And so this propensity to go the machmir route, go the stringent route, when all you really need to do is just, you know, make the shank, have the chops, roast it right. Now, we'll get back to that part of the story as I show you the Manish Tana as it exists in the Gemara. Now, in our standard Gemara, before we even get to the Manish Tana, we could note that it seems an assumption that the sages knew of a Manish Tana passage that already in Talmudic times, perhaps even in temple times, there was such a passage called Manish Tana for the celebration of Pesach. Whether it was in a tent outside the temple with your children, or it was in precincts way beyond Jerusalem, because not every Jew could make it for the holiday to Jerusalem, the sages seem to know that there's a Manish Tana passage. Lama Okrinat HaShulchan, there's this notion we have a banquet, a special meal at Passover time. And the school of Yanai says, why do we remove the table that's in front of at least the Seder leader? So the children will notice that something is unusual and they will ask, why is this night different from all other nights? Manishtana. Abaye was sitting before Rabbah when he was still a child. And he saw that they were removing the table from before him. And he said to those removing the table, Rabba, we have not eaten yet, and you're taking the table away from us? And Rabba says to him, you have exempted us from reciting the questions of Manishtana. So this is an old custom that goes back all the way, definitely, to Mishnaic times. In the Mishnah, as quoted by standard issues of the Gemara, standard printings of the Talmud Vilna, we see that it says, the attendants poured the second cup for the leader of the Seder, and here the son asks his father the questions about the differences between Passover night and a regular night. What are the questions in our standard printed editions of the Gemara? Matzah, bitter herbs, roasted meat, and dipping. So roasted meat is among the questions. Reclining was not. In the Talmud Yerushalmi, there's not four questions, but three. And the Jerusalem Talmud might be preserving the older tradition and the original tradition. The father asks him to ask, the child, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we dip vegetables once, but on this night, we dip vegetables twice. Ours says we don't dip at all, but we dip twice. We eat chametz and matzah, but on this night, it is all matzah. And we eat meat roasted, stewed, or boiled on every other night, but tonight, just roasted. You see that these questions, even the dipping question is different, and thusly, there's a little bit of history about the fact that they used to dip what they thought were bitter herbs, and then they stopped dipping what were bitter herbs, potentially in the question about the dipping, and they added a question about maror to make sure that they were hitting what Rabban Gamliel thought were the three main symbols of the Pesach Seder, matzah, maror, and the Pesach offering. The three questions in the early forms seem to track to what Rabban Gamliel thinks are the major three symbols of the Seder. But when the dipping stopped being about the maror, they added a special question in terms of maror, 
And then that question was actually integrated into printed editions of the Haggadah as it was already printed in the Talmud Bavli. You see that the questions are going through transformation. If we start with the Yerushalmi's three, and we think about the Bavli's four, which has roasted meat and maror, and then think about our printed Haggadahs that include no roasted meat question, but have reclining question, the paradigm is that there's obviously different questions to ask throughout different stages of Jewish ritual tradition and history. And in the end, those questions are all about open doors to asking what these symbolic foods and practices we have at the Seder are really all about. So that if we have certain practices of our own that we want to amplify with questions, we might be in good stead asking people to come up with supplemental and additional manishtana kinds of questions at our Seder tables. I'm not suggesting replacing or excising certain parts of the Haggadah. I embrace the liturgy as it was created for us by generations past, whether it would be stages of the Talmudic era, the Gaonic era, or the early medieval era, even into the era of the codification of the Shulchan Aruch. That's what it means to me to be an abiding Jew, to connect with all those narratives of those who came before me. But we see from the spirit of the history of the Manishtana itself, that one question, if in my community I didn't eat roasted meat, was replaced by a question about reclining. And reclining is not even about a Seder food itself, but a practice of the ritual of the Seder that I am engaged in at Pesach, then I have a gateway through which to walk. And as that Jew, that student of history, who wants to then involve myself in the creative process, like a rabbinic mind might create liturgy, I could indeed embrace this notion of asking a question, a Manishtana type question, about something we do at our Passover seders, or some part of the Passover story that might not even be highlighted in the Haggadah text itself. Thusly, what I suggest is that we might want to consider taking a deeper look at our own rituals this Pesach, or maybe a different verse from chapter 12 of the book of Exodus in order to generate a Manishtana type of question. Let's look at one verse and go through the exercise. You should see the verse, Exodus chapter 12, verse 42 on your screen. Is that right? This is a verse in the important chapter of the book of Exodus that describes the night of Passover in Egypt. And when I look at it and I read it aloud, it's not a familiar verse to me in terms of the Manishtana section, and I might not have asked a deep question about it in the past. So just picking one verse in our family that we have not investigated before allows us to generate new questions for the night of the Pesach experience, either at the Manishtana section itself, taking a break before we carry on, or during Shulchan Orech, when we're eating our meal. This year I'm printing this verse on a card or a piece of paper so that everybody has this verse in front of him or her, and they will generate questions about this verse at our Seder. If we have enough people, and we're figuring out our plans, just I imagine as you are, we might have two different verses and have one group report to the other about the questions that they generate as an act 
act of study during Shulchan Orech, during our Seder experience. That verse that I'm focused on here, 1242, is an interesting verse to me because, in a certain sense, the Jews were on lockdown the night of Pesach. And they waited their redemption. They awaited their redemption as we await, in some ways, our own taste of it in our time. Thank God we are not enslaved, and thank God we have kosher groceries coming out of our ears. But we are awaiting a redemption so that we can get back together with the people we love in person, entirely free of masks on our faces. We are awaiting the time when health will be the uh, absolute, absolute gift that all receive who are in need of a Rufu Shlema. The verse that I'm focused on is as follows. That was for the Lord a night of vigil to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That same night is the Lord's, one of vigil for all the children of Israel throughout the ages. Manishtana halayla hazeh, mikol halelo. What is different about this night in our pandemic reality? About this Pesach Seder night in the entire reality we've experienced over the last year? What are we sitting vigil for right now? What part do we have in creating a new reality and taking our matzah, throwing it on our backs, finding the strength and energy to ask the difficult questions of the policies that we think we have to trust, of renewing our relationship with Jewish law that can make meaning of our daily lives. What are the manishtana questions we can ask about this verse? What are we sitting vigil for? This unique night of the pandemic, or two nights of the pandemic, because we have two satyrs in sight. How are we going to, throughout the ages, take the kind of action on the human level? And what kind of trust are we going to put in God this Pesach? And what kind of prayers shall we offer in between the words of the Haggadah for the kind of world we need? for the kind of redeemed world that we foresee? How will we fill our lives and mouths with laughter this year at Pesach? To renew our study of central Torah texts about the Exodus at our Seder tables this year and say, what questions do we have about them? Enlivens the spirit of the Jewish hearts within us grafts on to the culture and the very paradigm that the rabbis created with the history in sight of Manishtana. There are many verses in chapter 12 that do not get highlighted during the Passover Seder. I highly recommend finding them in the Tanakh and picking out one or two to put on your table across from the cartoons and whatever little designs for laughter or renewing the ritual that you have in store this year at Pesach time. I pray that we are all able to be together with those we love and that we sense the power in our ritual this year as a gateway towards deeper redemption. Remember that the Torah says, and you shall tell your child. We shall retell this story of the Exodus. Even if they don't ask, says the Midrash, we shall tell and retell with laughter on our lips, with a seriousness of study, with generating new questions during this time of our vigil. As we prepare for our Pesach Seders and figure out what makes it different this year than any other year, as we study the Haggadah and the Manishtana section, we are fulfilling the mitzvah of deeper spiritual preparation and reviewing the Haggadah itself as a community. And it's been really my pleasure this morning to present these ideas to you. And I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts, reflections, and questions as we, Manishtana, make it different. Yash Koach, thank you, Rabbi. Really wonderful, wonderful. Rabbi, if I can ask a question, I find sure. that uh, 
I find it interesting that while the, uh, the questions went through changes over the years and they went and added the one about reclining, that um, we, we don't actually answer two of the questions. We never answer why we recline and we never answer why we did twice. So it's very interesting that uh, the kids ask the question, we go all the way through and never answer. And of course, also interesting that uh, the questions that we ask, uh, we actually do the rituals in reverse order. That is, first we recline, then we dip, then we do maror, and then we do matzah. So uh, how about if I uh, make it easy and just ask, uh, why did we dip twice? Very good. So it is true that asking questions doesn't always require an answer in our tradition. I have often said just on a general level in terms of questions and living with questions that we are, as Jews, really um, living with questions to which sometimes there are not even answers. That Jewish spirituality might be wrapped up in living with questions and asking even that question in a deeper way and building upon our questions and living with the reality that right now, teku, as the Gemara says, that that will be figured out when Elijah the prophet comes and the time <laughs> of redemption is near. So I think that the rabbis knew this and that's why that they built that into their hermeneutic. They built that into the editorial reality. Now, in terms of dipping the karpas and then dipping the maror into haroset, we, uh, we do get the sense of, of understanding why we dip the maror into haroset. And that is that we have this bitterness with the maror that needs to be sweetened. And God sweetened our judgment, if you want to come from the punishment, sin, judgment, theology point of view, and God sweetened the reality for us faster than God promised to Abraham because we were told we were going to be there 400 plus years, but we really weren't there for all those years. So we have a notion of maror and why we dip maror. By way of karpas, interestingly, there was not a long held tradition to always dip the karpas into salt water for tears. Most believe that that's relatively new and that the commentaries we have on the dipping of the karpas into salt water, I just happened to be collecting some of those as well. So I can share with you a, a few takes by different uh, commentators. The Marbe Lissaper uh, says in the Pesach Haggadah that karpas, the word itself, is derived from two words, which is karim, which means pillows, and pas, which means remove. And he says, the loyal have vanished from among men. And Psalm says, one who wishes to wear the crown of Torah must first throw away his pillow, his comforts. And we learn this in a vote. And this is the way that is becoming for the study of Torah, sleep on the ground and live a life of trouble. But then one takes back a pillow after learning a, a little bit and having a little trouble. That was the slavery and the salt water. And a person should see new life born. That is the karpas. And thusly, we create this word karpas and we have a, a pillow of comfort and a loyalty to Torah and as God had loyalty to us and a rebirth of the earth. And thusly we dip karpas into salt water. Marechet um, Heidenheim, which is an 1898 Frankfurt source on karpas says one dips green vegetables into salt water to symbolize that like karpas, we must undergo an entire immersion of one's body for the purpose of complete purification. One should not be like the person who immerses himself with an impure reptile in his mouth. It's not just for slavery, but it's a matter of purification. When God took us out of Egypt, God was taking away impurities and our more pure soul connected to Jewish tradition is what we hope to achieve like the rebirth of spring, so too a rebirth of our Jewish souls. So interesting, thank you for that question, Neil. And then by way of the answers, the idea was that if everything wasn't said in the Haggadah, you were responsible as leader slash educator at your Seder to embrace those questions for which there's no answer in the book, but find them and go and learn them. 
Other thoughts, questions? Just a halachic question about um, this Friday, because it's an unusual occurrence. Uh, and I read um, this big response from Rabbi Galinkin and about whether uh, you should just have egg matzah or whether you could uh, set aside a small portion of challah or chametz for the Shabbat, uh, for Arab Shabbat meal and what about Shabbat morning until 10 o'clock. What's your practice and what do you recommend? Okay, thank you for that question, Artie, because that to me is something that I uh, opine about a little differently than colleagues even in the neighborhood over here and Rabbi Galinkin, with respect. Uh, so Bior Hametz is Friday morning. That is the time that we are gonna burn Hametz. We in our family will make a little bit of fire in, a, in an old tin can and actually burn the 10 little pieces of breadcrumbs uh, that we find the night before. We actually plant those 10 little pieces and wrap them in a napkin with some masking tape and then burn them in our sink for Bior Hametz. We also have a practice to burn our spiritual Hametz. And this gives me a chance to remind everyone of our spiritual practice. We take little slips of paper and we kind of burn the Hametz in our souls or in our minds that we'd like to burn for the year. We keep having that recurring thought that brings us down. Amy and I have a practice with our children to take some time at our chametz dick table and write down little spiritual pieces of chametz within our souls and hearts and minds that we want to burn and just get rid of so that we can try to purify ourselves and get rid of that ego that we have as well that is representative of or represented by chametz as well, the, the boastful and the prideful. Friday morning, is when the actual burning happens. The collection of those little chametz pieces and our chametz notes is collected Thursday in a paper bag. We will burn that and we will uh, put the oven fan on and we will collect the, the, the smoke and we will burn it. And since the burning is Friday morning, even though some authorities say that you can set aside challah for Friday night only, not Saturday morning because it's just gonna to be too late unless you wanna eat your meal really early before the beetle, before the nullification formula of words Saturday morning. Some say that you can eat challah Friday night on your table that you've left as a chametz stick table, but only there. So you have to have all challah and bread products on your table Friday if you're gonna hold by this and have only only, only that little area in your home for challah Friday night and if you get up early to eat an earlier meal Saturday morning. I do not hold that that is halachically permissible. And the reason why is because, and this is lived Jewish experience, I believe, especially those who are in their apartments in New York where there's smaller spaces, that it's not worth chametzifying, if, if that's a word, it's not worth getting crumbs in our Pesach prepared places and our homes that are already set with Pesach kitchens. And plus, since Beor is Friday morning, and this is really the halachic argument that, that authorities have, since we really do burn the, and make a bitul potentially on Friday, I see no room to leave space for challah Friday night and Saturday morning, if you're gonna get up early again. Because for me, it's intellectually dishonest. If I'm gonna make the nullification Thursday night, burn my chametz Friday morning and make a formulaic cancellation, nullification, I don't want to find the halachic way in this case to let it go. And I don't want to have any potential crumbs anywhere with my challah on Friday night or Saturday morning. We're serious in our place about making sure that we keep a chametz-free zone during Pesach. And I've come out with that position and Charlie helped summarize it and write it within the newspaper, I, uh, within the newsletter. I didn't necessarily explain all this, so I appreciate the question in the context of our communal gathering today. But it's really my recommendation 
that we use egg matzah for the meals for Shabbat and not for uh, making any kind of space for those chalas that'll, that'll get crumbs inevitably. Somewhere we don't want them. And so that's, that's my encouragement. Even if you have the space and you're in a bigger home and, and you have a separate dining room down in the basement, uh, it's just not worth having to clean up all those crumbs and, and carry them with you into different spaces. So that's, that's the way I see the unfolding of the Shabbat ahead of us. And of course, we won't eat regular matzah or make anything with matzah meal. We'll make a little bit of mashed potato with, with chopped meat on top. We'll make some good vegetables and roast them. We'll, we'll you know, kind of start a, a pesadic kind of menu in order to get in the spirit. Charlie. I once tried that method of keeping a challah when the first Seda was done on a Saturday night. Sharon was still alive at the time, so this was a long time ago. We used the foyer um, for a challah plate. We used a piece of aluminum foil and we used a plastic knife. So we did hamotzi and then we just, I think it was a hollow roll and then we threw everything away. It's what you said, it was very hard. It was very difficult and actually made me feel uncomfortable. So we're doing the egg matzah. Uh, we're, we're not, it, it was just too different. It didn't seem right. You got rid of all the challah, but then you're keeping a piece and eating it and then going back to your dining room table, which is pace a dick. It just didn't well, make we, sense. We, I, I will say that I don't think it's halakhically forbidden by those whose authorities or whose rabbis say that it's possible, right? There, yes. is, there is space. I respect this fact that it's a different halakhic opinion out there. But lived Jewish experience is not a uh, one one size fits all experience, and in the way that I see it, that's that's what I'm uh, suggesting for our community. Yeah, so I, I'm doing. I bought a box of egg matzah. I'm doing it that way. I right. just want to say one other thing about the newsletter. Um, if you got the original link to the newsletter, I made some changes in the calendar. Not anywhere else, but just in the calendar, there were a couple of little things that were off. So look at the new versions. If you click the old link you got in the new, in, in that original thing, the new newsletter, the updated version will come out. And if you don't have it, email me and I'll email you a copy with everything correct. We're just putting the newsletter out monthly so quickly. It doesn't always get edited. Thank you, well Charlie. Thank to, you. We used to do it Thank every you. two months. Anybody uh, else? Last question, thought? Otherwise, I want to wish you a, a very, very sweet Pesach, a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Uh, be in touch with any uh, shilas or reflections or humorous material that I might be able to put on my table. And uh, <laughs> I really would appreciate your help. See you all for learning this week. There's a minion, of course, and Torah study at noon on Wednesday. A Seum for first board. No, Torah study noon on Monday. That's what I mean. Torah study noon on Monday. <laughs> Talmud class will meet Wednesday. Uh, see you on Thursday for the firstborn on Masechet Pesachim. And uh, Sidor class will still meet as well because uh, it's good to learn. It's good to be together. Take good care, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov.